committees. Prime Minister's questions. The member for Coover North. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Question number one. Can the Prime Minister explain the exorbitant increase of the estimated costs for the new Tobago terminal from 500 million to 870 million? Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, the figure of 500 million was a notional line item approximation used by the Minister of Finance about three years ago when um, the project was uh, mooted and it did not include proper designs and so on. So to use that figure as an exorbitant increase to 870 million is to misunderstand and misrepresent the situation. When the drawings were available and the, com the project was properly conceptualized, the engineer's estimate could have been established and that engineer estimate was $811 million. It, sorry, 881 million, I'm correct, I stand corrected. 881 was the engineer's estimate of the project as completely determined after the concept. When it went out to tender, Madam Speaker, the contract price is now 870 million because that is the process as per a contractor bidding on a specific design. So Madam Speaker, I, I take careful note of the fact that my colleagues consider this construction of $870 million facility in Tobago as exorbitant. They didn't find it exorbitant to leave a billion dollars in the field and beat them on a useless wastewater plant. They didn't find it. They didn't find $921 million exorbitant to leave with OAS when they removed when they removed the clause from the contract for the point 14 highway to allow OAS to go away with $921 million. And of course, Madam Speaker, this facility for Tobago is a facility for Trinidad and Tobago because it brings Tobago's economy as a contributor into the national economy as we grow the tourism product and plant in Tobago. We don't find it exorbitant at all. We find it a very useful investment in the nation's infrastructure. Speaker, Prime Minister, since it was an estimated cost of 500 million and has now gone to 870 million, how many years would it take the people of Trinidad and Tobago to repay this loan to the government of China? We don't allow that as a supplementary question. Member for Urupuch West. Prime Minister, as you are aware, Section 5 has already been published, which means the evaluation date has been established. Does this increase in the amount from 500 to 870, 870 include payments to Cronston residents on both sides of the agricultural lands, the payment for, for there to be removed for lands taken under compulsory acquisition? Speaker, I don't know what the law school is producing these days. This is the construction cost, and there's no second one, two, three, four, or five involved in this. This is the construction cost. We hire a contractor to build. The government was very clear at an earlier time and all along that there's a land acquisition process of a, an estimate of 300 million. The Minister of Finance has made that clear. This figure is the construction cost. One has to add to that the land acquisition because you have to have the land to build the facility on. Madam Speaker, and we are very clear on that. So there's no question of any section one, two, three, four, or five. Supplemental, number four, which is. Thank you very much. Well, Prime Minister, given your deep concern with the course of land acquisition for the Point Fourteen to San Fernando Highway, and the fact that in that project the government had estimated in advance what it will cost to acquire lands. Would you indicate what is the estimated cost in addition to the $870 million construction cost for a terminal? What is the estimated cost for, for the acquisition of lands pursuant to this project? Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, I suspect yes, that my colleagues are not present. I just stood up and said that the estimated cost for land acquisition is $300 million. And as I sit down, he gets up to ask me the same question. 
Finally, Madam Speaker, the construction cost is $870 million to build the facility. The land that is acquired for building the facility is subject to land acquisition processes. And I answer that in the context of a question being raised about Section 5. And we're saying that separate and apart from the construction cost is an estimate for land acquisition of $300 million. What is so difficult to understand? Mr. Could I ask the Prime Minister if the government believes that $1.1 billion plus is value for money for a terminal, for one terminal? Prime Minister. I just said yes, it's a major investment in the national infrastructure, in this case in Tobago, to facilitate an expansion of the tourism facilities in Tobago. We anticipate, Madam Speaker, that there would be significant growth in tourism in Tobago, and one facility to bring about that growth is a proper modern terminal to handle a larger number and larger aircraft in Tobago. Madam Speaker, anybody who professes to have any interest in Tobago will know that the existing facility in Tobago is an encumbrance and a hindrance to growth in tourism in Tobago. And I, I can't understand why my colleagues on the other side have a problem with constructing a terminal building in Tobago for $870 million, but they had no problem in giving OAS $921 million to Huawei. And you, you're part of it. Right? And you can say what you want. The people of Tobago will get their facility and this government is going to ensure that it's built. So I hope that we now regain our composure and this kind of outburst does not continue. Member for Baratara, San Juan, supplementary. Minister, I just want a small question. Um, how many Tobagodians do you think will be working on that project to build that, um, that um, terminal? Mr. Speaker, I have no specific figure, but I do know that opportunities will arise for Tobagodians to work on the project to build the terminal. The fact that it is being done by a locally registered Chinese company does not mean that Tobagonians are not a part of it. And Tobagonians will play a significant role in constructing that facility. To the Prime Minister, could the Prime Minister provide an update on the state of negotiation between the government and Patriotic Energies and Technologies Company Limited? as it relates to Patriotic being selected by the Cabinet to be the preferred bidder for the sale of Guaracara Refining Company Limited and Paria Fuel Trading Company Limited. Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, as we have indicated in this House before, one of the aspects of the uh, attempt to generate an interest in the reopening of the refinery was the creation of a data room before any bidding process had taken place, where interested parties could come and see the data relating to the operations of the refinery. Um, subsequently, Patriotic has been selected as the company of choice in the process. As we have done that, Patriotic has now indicated that they would like to see the actual refinery itself in greater detail. And as a result of that, several subject matter experts have been established, uh, a committee of subject matter experts, meaning persons who are uh, intimately familiar with the refinery as a physical entity. They are now preparing, next week they'll make their first uh, surgery into the refinery, along with Patriotic, to provide this additional information which they ask for, subject to the examination by the data, um, by information from the data room. That should be done early next week. And based on the outcome of these negotiations, Madam Speaker, a decision will be made about the final buyer for the refinery, and we hope to do so by the end of March. Member for Kuva South Supplemental. Thank you, um, Prime Minister. Could you confirm uh, if Patriotic has uh, been able to 
um, indicate to the government of Trinidad and Tobago that it is, a, it is in a position to purchase, to finance the purchase and uh, operations of the refinery. Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, to the best of my knowledge, that is a process that is on the way. I know of no withdrawal of enthusiasm or expectation. The process is on the way. Aparima. Uh, would you say on, re on reflection that it was a mistake to close the Petrotrin refinery given the problems that you encounter and the cost of restarting the, the, the said project? Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. So, Prime Minister, you, are t you have, based on what you have said to this House today, the uh, work of the evaluation committee. What is the status of the evaluation committee as it relates to this preferred bidder status that was granted to Patriotic? Because the evaluation committee was supposed to finish its work within six weeks of the statement that was made by the Minister of Finance in the other place when the Parliament was in operation. I have to understand, Madam Speaker, that no one party can negotiate by itself. It's a negotiating process. The evaluation committee has to work alongside the company that is prepared to take up the issue. So there is some element of delay involved, but we can't go faster than Patriotic is prepared to go. And we, the evaluation committee has to have something to evaluate. So if Patriotic has asked for additional information in this expert review of the plant, what, that is just a part of the process. Member for Point up here. Thank you. Prime Minister, based on after Patriotic has evaluated this extra information about the refinery and they have withdrawn and they are no longer interested, what will be the position? Sure. Prime Minister, based on what you said about Patriotic, requiring more information about the refinery and doing an evaluation of it or, or evaluation. After, if they, the information is given to them and they now withdraw their, their bid or their interest, what will be the position as far as the refinery for the country of Trinidad and Tobago? Prime Minister. Speaker, that should be a relatively easy question to answer. We get back to square one where we were, where we did not, we don't have a bidder. As the, the process generated that uh, patriotic, selection of patriotic, and we are working with them towards a point where if they complete their interest in the matter, then we have a, a restart of some time. What is happening now is we're moving from the data room evaluation to actually looking at the refinery itself, the actual refinery. This expert group we talk about is going to, going to go through the refinery with Patriotic to ensure that it is um, clear as to what the restart would require and in terms of and the investment in the restart. So this is the process. If along the way Patriotic determines that it is too much for them or they're no longer interested, well, then we're back to square one. We don't have an interested party. And we will have a refinery which would be number 18 in the world, which is not operating. What we're doing is trying to get um, to work alongside the interested party to determine whether we are in a position to restart the refinery or not. And that is a process that I've just outlined. Supplemental member for Obu Chiefs. Thank you very much. Madam Speaker. Prime Minister, in the context of the Minister of Finance announcing with great fanfare the selection of a preferred bidder and the only local company with knowledge of the refinery and with, that brought money to the table, is it that you are telling us today the government don't know if, where, and how much money the preferred bidder can raise and the preferred bidder now needs a tour of the installation to better position their bid? Prime Minister, what kind of Mickey Mouse business has been taking place on this matter? That is not a question. That is, that, Madam, Madam Speaker, that is not a question. That is not a question requiring an answer. That's an opinion. That's an opinion, and I'm not prepared to comment on the opinion of an underminer. 
member for Kearney Central. Um, Prime Minister, based on the recent exchange one, of one, old one, one, one. Uh, member for Kearney Central, one minute, please. I just heard somebody use certain language that I really don't think is appropriate for you. Okay? And while it is that we are very passionate about what our views are in here, I would ask everybody to maintain the type of decorum that is required and expected, okay? And which the people of Trinidad and Tobago deserve. Okay? Member for Oropo I know you, you are seasoned and you know much better. So just withdraw that and let's get swiftly along. Sir, I withdraw. Thank you very much. Member for Ka uh, No. Uh, uh, member for Cuba South. Member for Lavantel West. The same applies. Okay? Member for Garani Central. Sorry. Please continue. Prime Minister, based on the recent exchange of old $100 bills for new polymer notes, can the Prime Minister inform this House what is the total quantum of money disbursed by the Central Bank to cover the replacement of old $100 notes? Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, as of today, the Central Bank reports that the exchanges in the context, the disbursement in the demonetization process is $5.4 billion. Supplemental member for Garden Central. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. If that is the amount uh, collected from outside, what is the quantum of money, to your knowledge, within the banking and financial sector? Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I, um, I, I would like my colleagues to use the same verb that I use. It is not what is collected from outside. The question it would, uh, answered is what did the central bank disburse to the banking community? The central bank disbursed in terms of new notes to the banking community for the purpose of exchanging $5.4 billion. I don't know where the collected is coming from because that confuses the issue. And if, if one wants to get accurate information, one needs to see exactly what we're talking about. There's a big difference between what the central bank would have made available to the commercial banks as against what we have collected from them because money could have been made available from the bank, to the, to the, from the central bank, to the other banks, which is not collected. So I would just make that clarification. Supplemental, member for Karen Central. Would the Prime Minister be able to say how much money was exchanged by no, how much money was exchanged by citizens using the opportunity to exchange old notes for new notes? Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, I am not in a position to give an accurate figure on that. And you know, if I understand the member's question, the Central Bank makes certain information available through its quarterly reports. And secondly, if the member wants to file the appropriate question to the Minister of Finance, who can consult the central bank on that level of detail, and I'm sure the answer could be forthcoming as long as it doesn't violate the Central Bank Act. Member for Kearney Central. Yes. Do, is the amount that the 5.4 billion that the Prime Minister indicated uh, was disbursed for this purpose, is that the total quantum of notes ordered by the central bank and printed to cover the entire exchange process, or was it a larger amount? Prime Minister. Central Bank, Madam Speaker, in carrying out this exercise, would have been cognizant of the amount of money 
that is supposed to be in circulation through $100 bills. And it would manage to it would be logical, as it was factual, for the central bank to have ordered enough money to cover the monies that were out in circulation. And the member knows where he can find the figure of what was in circulation. And the answer is that the central bank did order as much money as was required to cover what was in circulation. So it, had a, it would have ordered far more than 5.4 billion. Member for Kyrie Central. Um, Prime Minister, given the downward trend of natural gas and related commodity prices across the world, and given the growing uncertainty faced by all energy stakeholders in the current environment, could the Prime Minister state what new approach, if any, will the government take to address the survival of stakeholder companies and the sustainability of Trinidad and Tobago's natural gas cluster? Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, with respect to the question speaking about all energy stakeholders, this covers everyone involved and dependent on the energy sector, whether it's the government, the, public, the private sector, the public sector, the local sector, the international sector. Uh, as you know, Madam Speaker, the hydrocarbon business, oil and gas, particularly oil, is very volatile. And in recent times, in the last 24 months in particular, the prices have gone up, down, and across. And of course, in the last five years, the market has changed considerably. In some instances, consumers have become consumer export importers have become exporters, and we in Trinidad and Tobago are severely impacted by that. But at the end of the day, Madam Speaker, all these energy stakeholders have an interest in ensuring that there is business in a place like Trinidad and Tobago. So upstreamers who would hold on to uh, uh, prices for supplying the raw material to downstreamers would have an interest in ensuring that downstreamers exist and downstreamers are operating and surviving and discounting in a marketplace where the prices are quite volatile. What the government is doing is staying in contact, not only as a shareholder through the NGC and as an owner with respect to the acreage that is exploited, but in talking to all those involved to ensure that we are all stakeholders in this business. And while we uh, acknowledge the sanctity of contracts, we believe that contracts are not cast in stone. So it is in everybody's interest to ensure that those who are involved as their counterparts in the business, that they all survive together. Supplementary member for Kyrie Central. I'm glad to hear that multiple uh, engagements, discussions are taking place um, within a stakeholder framework. Um, but does that, I mean, given this situation, as it is now, it is clear that all methods of practice and past decisions may not be applicable in the new environment. And what I ask in the question is that, are you going to change the approach of the government in trying to bring these stakeholders to bear in a common framework towards uh, sustaining a Trinidad and Tobago industry. Insofar as the government has been very proactive in taking this conversation to the principals at the level of the decision making in these companies, such a framework does exist. And for example, um, the treatment you would have heard me in this house last Friday, I think it was, speak about what is to happen at train one with Shell and BP and the Chinese company that owns 10%. This is uh, an approach of bringing everybody together to confront the essence of this question, that things have changed and are changing, and we need to adjust to see so that train one could survive. And we did mention, I don't know if you noticed, a positive position with train one, where there was a commitment to keep train one in place, and of course, which could have an effect on train three, and also, a major development in the government's discussion 
talking to all the companies at the level of the boardrooms and those who make the decision that we are talking now about the new arrangement for the shareholding in Atlantic LNG, where, for example, the government of Trinidad and Tobago, which only now owns a shareholding in train one and train four, that we're talking about a, a unitization of the shareholding and we distribute shareholding across all the trains for all the shareholders. So this is a major development. The discussions are underway. We have partial agreement in some quarters and we are still trying to persuade others to join in. At the end of the day, hopefully, in the second quarter of this year, we should be in a position to have adjusted that old framework into this new framework, which I dare say would be of much better value for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Member for Thank you. Prime Minister, is it, um, could, could, could you enlighten us a, a bit on whether your intervention, your intervention and that of the member for Port of Spain, Northeast, St. Anne's West, in Houston, uh, some months ago, um, in terms of the, uh, the, in terms of the price that was offered to the upstreamers, uh, would you say that that intervention, in some way, uh, 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 led to parts of the problem that exists today? And if so, what lessons have you learned about government's intervention in that exercise? Now, the first question. The first question. That I'm not even sure if the question is the first one, but Madam Speaker, with your permission, I'll try to answer the question. Madam Speaker, not for the first time, and I'm sure it wouldn't be for the last time, the attempts by my colleagues on the other side to misrepresent the, to misrepresent the government's role, I would today respond to. What was happening at the time when we intervened in this matter, Madam Speaker, is that the NGC and BP had stopped negotiating. They both had dug their heels in on who wanted what at the upstream and who was prepared to pay what. What the country could not accept, Madam Speaker, was a grinding to a halt of the operations of the upstreamers in particular because there was no gas price agreement for gas supply. What we did in that Houston meeting, Madam Speaker, wasn't to enter, interfere in the gas price di um, discussion in terms of determining what the price should be. But what we did was to get the two entities to come back to the table and to talk to one another and to agree on a gas price. And that is what they did. And that is what, Madam Speaker, guaranteed that there was a supply of gas in Trinidad and Tobago, and that is what carried the industry. Had we continued the way we were going, Madam Speaker, what was the outcome going to be? If the upstreamer is not prepared to produce the gas because there was no price agreed upon, there would have been no gas to supply our industries here. And I don't know why my colleagues are so upset about the fact that we did manage to get them to agree to a price. And once BP agreed to a price, Shell came on board and ENG, EOG came on board and there was $5 billion in investment that was kicked off immediately after that. As a result, as a result of that, Madam Speaker, Trinidad and Tobago's exploration has now become extremely active and we are now looking at, for the next five years, we are committed and we continue to announce developments arising out of that foundation where we had a gas price. And Madam Speaker, finally, to be grilled by people who did not even initiate and had us here as a country with not even opening discussion about a gas price when we had business in Point Lisas depending on a gas price for the supply from the upstream to be received by the downstream, it was downright irresponsible and dangerous and the best thing that ever happened in this country is that this government got a gas price which generated activity that we are now looking towards in the future. So Madam Speaker, I refuse to accept that the government's intervention bringing the parties to an agreement is something that we should apologize or be ashamed of. We are proud of what we have done because we have saved this country's energy sector. Supplemental, Member for Approach West. Thank you, Honorable Prime Minister. What was the gas price agreed upon? Could you repeat that question? What was the gas price agreed upon? I will not allow that. I will not, I will not allow that as a supplemental question. Honorable members, the time for Prime Minister's question is now spent.